everybody. Um, so um, I guess I, I took the, the uh, um, uh, opportunity I got uh, in Peninsula to finish the third part of the talk that I didn't get to give in, uh, uh, in Pai Bay uh, or in Colorado. So this is like the first time uh, that uh, I'm getting to get uh, this, this part, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the talk, and I was like so sorry that I had to head out at the last minute. Um, so the whole talk was about boring object orientation, where I explained how to make things more boring uh, and less interesting. Uh, and possibly one of the most interesting features in Python is inheritance. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how not to do that. Um, OK, so a lot of times you see people uh, treating inheritance as API, meaning um, to write code using this framework, please inherit from this class and override this method. Right? Um, one of the first people to do that was me. Uh, this is written by me, the Twitter tutorial, the old figure Twitter tutorial. Um, I suggested, hey, let's uh, you know, like have a uh, class line receiver, and it will uh, you override the uh, um, the line received, and you know you get the user, and you write also the user, and that's like how you implement the finger protocol in Twitter. And I was like, this is a great API. Everybody should do that. Um, and then I was like, man, he has a great idea. So we'll do that too. Now this is from the Django story. This was not written by me. Uh, this was written sometime after the first example, and they were like, this inheritance thing as an API is so good. The way you write a list view is you inherit from the generic list view, and you override the template name, and blah, blah, and then they get query set, and, and you get awesome, right? So we have, this is how you write Django, right? This is from the latest Django story. So this is not like an ancient version. Uh, people still do that. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this documentation as you can see it uh, goes to the screen. But how do you write a new kernel in Jupyter? Ah, you inherit from the basic kernel and you write like, you know, banner and do execute and you and a bunch of attributes and blah, blah, and you have a new kernel. Uh, so this is good, right? Obviously, everybody doing it. Uh, so it's a great idea. Uh, and we should keep doing that, right? No. Uh, so we should not do that. Um, so what happens when you inherit, right? Inheriting means you share everything, right? You think underscore attributes are private, but they're not private, right? They're like, you know, in the big pile of like attributes on the object, right? There's no difference between underscore attributes that come from the uh, superclass. And, would, and then you have like the under under, which is like really annoying and weird and like will confuse you more than it's worth. And this actually like, you know, caused like a, a real bug. It twisted it that took me like, like a couple of days to figure out. So this is not just a theoretical issue, but it is also like a theoretical issue, right? Like you don't have any way to say, this is like mine and this is yours. And like, you know, and then you override this. And like, so you write a lot of documentation, but this method you should override. These methods never override. If you override any of those, everything will break, right? And usually you'll find that the recommendation will literally say words like that because it's all a big, Pi, right? And like, you know, the whole point of Python, namespaces are good. Let's make more of it. It's not that let's put everything in one big namespace. That's totally the opposite. Uh, so what do we do instead? Um, so this is like the way to kind of approach the thing that inheritance and API was meant to solve. We use something called composition. And this means we separate two things that the inheritance with an API was meant to do. One is what interface is expected of our object. Right? The inheritance of API implicitly has an interface that is expected of our object, right? It has all the methods that were already pre-supplied, and then a bunch of methods we were supposed to supply. Right? So that was an interface. So instead of supplying those and, and just kind of like it is, you just define. Here are the methods that I expect you to supply, right? This is a very clear interface because I know what methods I'm expecting to supply. But the problem is just like in the case of the Jupyter kernel, right? Or in the case of this, there's a shared functionality. Right, like in Twitter, it was like parsing lines. And the different kernel is like only uh, game you have to play with MQTT. Right, it's annoying to have to write it. Like there was a reason why they chose to do inheritable stuff. Right, because they're like, oh my God, this is a lot of cool. Right, so instead of that, what we do is we say, okay, all this behavior was useful, and we put it in a referred class. Right, so we separate out the concern. We say, okay, this is a helper. You don't have to use it, but you almost definitely need to. It defines its own interface. It's probably a sub-interface of your interface. And this is the interface you have to supply. We separate out those concerns. We separate out those, in those, those namespaces. And now we have two different namespaces, which is great, because now you know which interface you put it in. Um, so here's a simple <coughs> example, right? This is a very uh, uh, simple 
uh, interface for a movable object. So it can report its X position or its Y position, and then we think it will update its position, right? Um, you notice that when you write an interface, you do not put self because the interface is about how you call it, not about how you implement it, right? So this is how you call things, write this out and an extra argument. Okay, so uh, for example, you can uh, imagine some of these moving the straight lines. Right, so it has the x and the y and the tick, right, because that's part of the interface, right, and that I implement in the Um But now to actually, it, it actually wants to implement tick, right, and every tick, it will change the x position by, by some amount, <coughs> the y position by some amount, and this is how you, uh, if you remember something from, what class is that? Some class in, in, in math, um, then you'll, you'll have to believe me that this is a straight line. If you remember that, you'll actually be able to see this is a straight line. It's a straight line. It's kind of constant speed on a straight line, right? So it's the simplest movement imaginable. Um, so now imagine you want to write a sprite, right? The sprite um, in the old world, we may, we may be like you. Uh, you would have like some mixing that like you could also inherit from a straight line which would move along a straight line. Of course, that's the worst, right? Inheritance of the API almost always leads to like this mixing issue, right? Where like you, know, you have all these mixings and like your typical inheritance is like five. And when I said in the beginning, inheritance is one of the most interesting things in Python that's exactly how you get to be that interesting and it's also interesting, like boring, right? Um, so this is how you do, in, uh, uh, do it in the boring world, right? In the boring world, you say, the sprite doesn't inherit from something. It has a movable field, but of course, it doesn't want to implement X position and Y position and stuff, so it forwards all of them, right? It has a property X position that forwards to the movable. And, you know, like in the real world, you probably have an extra thing here, right? Then you have a property of like the image and, and, a, and a method called render, which would render the sprite and maybe a bounding box, whatever. You would, you would have all of that, but this is the minimum you need for the sprite, right? It has a, a movable. I don't know how to move. All the questions about how to move should be forwarded to my underscore movable class. Right, so it still implements the same interface. It has an X position and a Y position and a tick, but it doesn't have to worry about like, you know, whether it moves in a straight line, the constant speed or so on. Um, yeah, and, and that, that's actually like, um, oh. um, so that, that's basically it, right? That's all we need to do. To do um, so the, the usual complaint here is about now I have to write all this stuff, right? I, like, you know, in the old world, if I just write a sprite, I would just inherit from, uh, uh, um, from abstract movable probably. And then like, like, you know, to kind of have a straight line uh, uh, um, sprite, I would inherit from uh, um, abstract sprite and, and straight line. And, but I wouldn't have to do anything, right? So the, in return for the simplicity, we need to do explicit forwarding. Um, so one, one thing that actually make good, makes the, the explicit forwarding good is that you actually see what you forward, right? You, you have to make a specific decision. What you forward. If you want to override something, you, you know that you're overriding, you know what the interface is. Like there's nothing hidden anymore. There's nothing that I, I don't have to tell you, right? And this is actually important because um, often what the inheritance API leaves people to do is to add more methods to the superclass because now they'll be available in all the, all the, the um, well, subclasses. Of course, um, you remember that this is all one big namespace. So if any of the things below that ever overrode this, this uh, method, suddenly this means you change the interface. When you have inter explicit interfaces, now you know this is the interface, right? If, if movable added another attribute, I would, if straight line added another attribute, I wouldn't care. If the interface changes, of course, everything changes, but you can't change the interfaces, right? Because an interface is a double sided contract. Right? So it, an interface promises you that as long as you implement these methods, you implement the interface. And it promises that anything that implements the interfaces, implements the methods. So you cannot either add or remove interfa methods from interfaces anywhere. And so once you have the method, it's obvious what the, what the contract that has to remain always the same is, which is the, the contract is immovable. Everything works along the, um, along the movable contract. And once you add that and you have composition, then uh, you don't use inheritance as an API, which means you're very, very clear about what you expect your users to override, what you expect your users to supply, and it gives you pressure to not expect too much of the interface. The more you expect <laughs> the interface, the more you have to forward. So people tend to pull back a lot of logic 
into the function of the taken object, which is again a very uh, uh, important pressure on the uh, on interfaces. Um, okay, I think I think that's all I have to talk about. Uh, it's, I think I just about reached the 50 minutes, maybe 12 minutes. Um, so uh, thank you all. I hope that was an enjoyable talk. It was kind of short, but I hope I taught you why you should never use interfaces as you heard. It. Thank you all. <laughs> Right, so this is not the problem here. It's not it's very complex. In fact, it's like exactly one method. Right. And and even basic line saver has like three methods. The problem is not complexity. The problem is um, uh, kind of I guess oversharing or kind of like you know over friendliness, right? Uh, the line receive method is implemented in, in in line receiver to kind of but it's it's supposed to be overridden. But if you ever overwrite uh, the uh, data received. Weird things will happen. How do you know? You don't, right? Because like you know, only I know that because I wrote it. So <laughs> no, but I'll see it. But that's the point, right? You suddenly have to like document. So it, that that open enough that we actually did by the document. But there's all these like you know weird uh, corner cases, right? Probably if you now have an attribute called that for buffer, it will also be shared, and you actually get like you know weird uh, weird things. But underscore buffer is not documented anywhere, right? Because it's an underscore attribute. So actually, what like receiver does is it's under under buffer so that it's like underscore like high receiver buffer. So you have to make, play all these games to compensate for the thing that you basically put everything in one big uh, uh, namespace. Right? If you think about like why 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 ever do you need space namespace? Just have you know like just have it built into the name of the of the R variable. So it's that right? It's not a good idea. Uh, the problem here is not complexity. It's, it's kind of like very close sharing of two namespaces. Okay, I think we had a question. Yeah, I guess so. Um, composition helps you avoid kind of like somebody else changing something that you're expecting. It's not sharing. What it helps you is make sure you know what namespace you're on at any given time. Because it's explicit. Because it's explicit, right? So um, here, the line received namespace and the secret protocol namespace are the same namespace, right? Imagine that this, this can be a very long class, right? With its own attributes and stuff like that, right? And line receiver is a very long class. Like, the, those two namespaces at runtime get merged together, uh -huh. right? You don't know what um, when when we have like movable, the namespaces didn't move, didn't move didn't merge together, right? Everything I wanted to forward was explicitly forwarded. If straight line has an attribute that is not documented here, right? Straight line actually has that attribute. It has the x, 
you cannot access the x through the spike, right? The x is part of the so if a spike wants its own the x for its own reasons, right? And it, it didn't mean by that difference the x is going to actually some other thing that says the x stands for, then it will be fine. You would not be stepping on each other's toes, right? Here you only forward x position, y position, take is not for the x, right? Uh, okay, I think Carmen has a question, and then I think we'll be done. And just really quickly, the, the decorator uh, at the center. Yeah. Uh, what is that? I just said, I'm not uh, oh, so uh, that part of the interface. What it does is it means Sprite declare that it implements uh, the interface movable. And if you look, straight line also implements the interface movable. Uh, so what does it let you do? Uh, not too much, but it does do some things. So the first thing it does is if you, if you write code like that, and you install exactly the right thing using my pipe, then it will actually check when you construct a sprite that you construct it with an eye movable, right? Because it knows that um, move underscore movable is supposed to be of type and movable. So, you know, right now the only thing that you construct it doesn't create another eye movable with straight line. So, the only thing I could put in here is a straight line. If I had like accelerated straight line or exponential line or whatever, I could put in the, but it would actually check its static time. Uh, even nicer, you can add one time check. So there's a, uh, a function called verify object. And you'll take an object and check A, that it thinks it declares the interface, and B, that it actually has all the methods and uh, attributes that it expects. Um, I guess uh, uh, not to badmouth other languages, but I really like to badmouth Go. Uh, this is exactly the opposite of Go, right? In Go, the way to implement the interface is to implement the right attributes. Here it's the exact opposite. First, you have to say, I want to implement this interface. Right, this is really important because if you have two interfaces that have very similar methods, you say, I want to implement iSprite, or I want to implement iSprite 3D. And the fact you implement iSprite 3D does not mean you implement iSprite 2D. It's reasonable because it's three dimensional spike, it's not two dimensional spike, even though the interface is a subset of it, right? So you, you explicitly declare which interface you meant to uh, uh, implement. And then if you try to use the wrong interface, you can put shouting in various places, right? For example, I could here, I can do it in, in, in a static way. I could also put a dynamic validator to check that I movable indeed, the other movable indeed uh, validates this I movable by doing verify objects. Um, it says, um, but the read actually leads me to like, I'll just finish one more sentence. Then. <laughs> uh, um, literally today, um, my article about Zop dot interface came out on OpenSoft.com. So I guess I'll pitch that. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's been well received. Uh, if you want to go to OpenSoft.com and check my interface about the, the, the interface. Um, yes, part of the solution to uh, inherited the API is interfaces and Zop dot interface. So it interfaces really nicely and I highly recommend using it. Um, so I guess thank you everybody for great questions.